Church, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us all rejoice and be glad in it. Shall we offer our praise to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords through this responsive reading? When I lift my hand in a certain direction, the, con the congregation in that direction will respond. Will, will respond. Hosanna! Blessed, Blessed is the one, one who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord. Hosanna! Rejoice for, for the Lord, Lord is in our midst. He comes with joy and hope. He comes to set us free from fear. Everyone? Hosanna, Hosanna. Glory to God in the highest heaven. Amen. Shall we all stand up? Church, let us lift our voices before God and let us declare His greatness in our lives. Amen? Is God is great? Is God is great? Yes. Amen. So can we just give Him a round of applause? Hosanna to the King of Kings. Hosanna to the Lord of Lords. Join us as we sing our praises to our God. Here, Lord Jesus. 
his throne come let us adore him behold our king nothing can compare come let us adore him
so grateful and thankful for the salvation that you have given us. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Praise be to our, our Savior, our God, our Savior. Father, as we commemorate, as we observe the suffering and death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ this week, this coming week, instill in our hearts and minds the great love and mercy of our Lord Jesus who suffered at the cross for the sake of our salvation. Father, we thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, Jesus, for the redemption of our sins. As our Lord came in the form of a servant and became obedient unto death on the cross for our sake, we pray, O oh God, for your strength, for your guidance to each one of us so that we can truly live for our Lord who gave his life for us. Help us, Father, by your grace to live a life pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Forgive whatever sins we have committed against you and against our fellow men. We may have unconsciously thought evil of someone who wronged us or spoken profane or bad words against somebody, or even fail to spend quality time with you and your word. Or at times we may have ignored the guidance of your Holy Spirit in us. Lord, forgive us. Search our hearts, O God. And indeed, if there is any wicked way in us, Grant us your mercy and cleanse us by the blood of Jesus from every sin in us so that we can truly worship you in spirit and in truth. And whatever, whatever anxiousness or uncertainties or confusion or pain or any challenges that are beyond our control, such as illness, failures, broken relationships, grief, or any challenges in life or in the family. We pray, Father, for your mighty hand to meet the various needs and concern of your children who are standing before you at this time. Lord, we pray for restoration of relationships, provisions for various needs and challenges of your people who are going through pain or maybe trials in life. And I pray for your peace to rest upon those who are in pain, those who are in need of your guidance. Maybe they are also confused with life. We praise you, Lord, that you are our living God, our compassionate Savior, and our all-powerful God. Father, we also rejoice and give you thanks at this time for one, 
of our a church goer and one who have served you here in this church, Xian Yu, who have decided to follow our Lord in water baptism. Indeed, Lord, he has been faithful serving you for quite some time, and we are thankful for his life. We pray, O Lord, that his faith and trust in you will bear much fruit to bring you honor and glory. Bless his heart's desire and commitment to you. Father, bless to our mouthpiece this morning, your servant, Reverend Stewart Young, as he will soon speak forth your word to instruct us, to impart spiritual instruction for us so that we may grow spiritually in your word and through your word, O Father. Lord, we pray for your anointing and empowerment upon him. Bless each of our hearts and minds, dear Father, as we continue to worship you, as we pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may now be seated. Before our beloved speaker, Reverend Stewart Young, will give us the word of God, we will be having a, 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 a baptism for our brother, uh, Xian Yu. He has went through uh, baptismal classes in our church and affirmed by our pastors that he indeed is a follower of Christ. And today he wants to follow Christ in water baptism. Water baptism, firstly, is obedience to the command of Christ. Christ commanded his disciples to all who believe they will be baptized. And second, it is a testimony of one's faith in Christ. Though this would be an outward ceremony, and yet there is that inward commitment to Christ in following Him. And thirdly, water baptism is our identification with Christ in His suffering, in His death, and His resurrection. Now, we want to hear your thoughts at this moment, the thoughts of your hearts. Have you indeed truly accepted Christ as your personal Savior and Lord? Upon, upon, the, prof upon the profession of your faith in Christ and in obedience to His command, I now baptize you, shine you, Shine you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. May God's plan and will for your life be done for the greater honor of His name. Amen and amen. We now welcome you, cordially welcome you into God's family, into Christ's fellowship as UECP. Uh, as UECP, uh, one of UECP family member. God bless. <laughs> we may now call on our speaker, Reverend Stewart Young. Our scripture for today is found in the book of Matthew. Chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. Matthew 21, verses 1 to 11. Let's all rise as, our, as we read our passage together. Matthew 21, verses 1 to 11. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. 
If anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, praise God for the son of David, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in his highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this? They asked. And the crowds replied, It's Jesus. It's the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. You may be seated. Our speaker for today is no new face to us. It's Reverend Stewart Young. He's a former principal and Bible teacher in Hope Christian High School. He has degrees in Bible, Biblical Studies and a PhD in Philippine Studies. His ministries involve um, being a Department of History process, Professor at the Ateneo de Manila University and also preaching during Sundays. Let's now give our undivided attention this morning to our speaker for today, Reverend Stuart Young. Well, praise the Lord that we can be here once again after many, many years, right? It's good to see a lot of you, familiar faces, and many more that are probably not so familiar. Okay, but anyway, it's great to be here to share the Word of God. As we all know, today is Palm Sunday, and in the Palm Sunday in the Philippines is a very unique thing. The Philippines is known as a Catholic nation and, you know, part of the tradition of the Catholic celebration of the Palm Sunday centers around, <clears throat> you know, the, the waving of the palm fronds. Now, everywhere you go and the faithful across the Philippines will be buying these balaspas and, and palm, very decorative palm arrangements in which the faithful would bring to the church and then when they bring it all to the church they would uh, get it blessed by the priest and the priest would kind of do their thing and that's supposed to be a supercharged thing that they have right so i talked to some people about this and what did they do with that afterwards right and afterwards they would bring it home and the faithful would keep it in their house they would usually you know put it in their homes and and you Use it as a, a good luck charm okay so this will be kind of like a nice gesture to remember this this event on Palm Sunday then after one year the following year they will bring it to church during Holy Week or the beginning of the Lenten season in which the priest would burn and use the ashes to put on the forehead so the people to remind uh, the faithful of their mortality a very interesting practice. But what does this have to do with the biblical account of Palm Sunday? What is the significance of the triumphal entry as we talk about this passage of Scripture? You know, as a pastor, I've talked about this passage of Scripture in many, many places over the past, I don't know, 30 years or so. And it's always this passage of Scripture that we talk about on Palm Sunday, right? I mean, I'm sure many of you have heard it many, many times already. But, you know, for me, somehow preaching this somehow leaves a sense of dissatisfaction. You know, this, is, this has got to be one of the most anticlimactic passages in all Scripture. Right? Because after all, these people are celebrating, yelling Hosanna, waving palm fronds, you know, welcoming this king to come, and Jesus riding on a donkey like the story goes. But yet at the same time, the immediate story that takes place in Scripture 
is that upon his arrival after the triumphal entry, he went to the temple court area, and lo and behold, there are a lot of people preparing for the Passover season from all over the world coming to Jerusalem. And they were um, exchanging their foreign currency to the local currency so that they can purchase um, the animals needed for the sacrificial uh, offerings that is needed at Passover. So Jesus came into the temple and he was furious because they turned this holy place of prayer into a house of corruption. Now, why was it corruption? Because this money changer would kind of overcharge, you know, and, and kind of do a kickback for themselves. So Jesus saw all this as, this, you know, you're doing all this stuff, you're praising me, but yet at the same time, you're still doing all these nonsensical things. You know, and, and lo and behold, what happened to all the people who were praising him? Hosanna, Hosanna. A week later, Jesus was presented by Pontius Pilate before the crowds, the same crowd who came for the season. And basically, everybody ended up saying, crucify him. You know, so for me, it, sits, it doesn't sit well with me. You know, and although we know this passage of Scripture, and, and we're going to look at this once again, I'd like to challenge you to kind of look at this passage of Scripture with a new lens or a new outlook. Okay, we'd like to try something different today. As we all know, this is Holy Week, and the culminating events lead to that. Now, how is this occasion related to the Holy Week? All right, my agenda today is this. There are four Gospels, as you all know. Today, we'll be looking at the Gospel of Matthew and his account of this story. But this is such an important account and biblically significant. That is why all four Gospels all wrote about this. Well, I have to keep in mind that each of the Gospel writers are coming from a different point of view. They have a different intended audience. They have a very different writing style. It was different for different occasions. And yet, at the same time, when they talk about this event, they're approaching it from a particular perspective. And the beauty about the, the story that we have here is that this is covered from four different perspectives, and it gives us a fuller picture of this event. Because when you look at any one of these separately and just leave it at that, there are things that other accounts um, emphasize or, or bring to light which the others do not. So in order to get a fuller and more complete picture, we want to take a look at the Gospels from the four perspectives and in this particular passage of Scripture. So the outline for today is simply this. We're going to stay with Matthew's account, and we'll kind of sidetrack to, to some other accounts to kind of fill in the gaps, okay? Now, before we begin to talk about our outline for today, let me just say, this is not a devotional service or a devotional preaching today. I'm not just going to give you some bullet points and, you know, you do this and, and everybody's happy afterwards, okay? We're going to think today. This is going to be a teaching session, right? Hang in your seatbelts. We've got a lot to cover today. I'm a teacher, okay? That's my gift. And I hope that we can teach something today from the Word of God. The first part of this 11 verses, it's only 11 verses, okay? And the first part of this 11 verses is focusing on the preparations for the triumphal entry, verse 1 to 3. Secondly, we're going to get into the section that talks about the significance of why this is in a prophetic section. So in for, verse 47, it kind of highlights the word prophecy. Then the third part is actually the procession when Jesus came into Jerusalem doing his triumphal entry and the reactions of the people. And then finally, the response of the people at the end, the two very awkward passages at the end where kind of leaves you unfulfilled in a way because at the end of all the celebration and yelling and waving on the palm fronts and all that, people were like, who's this guy? All right, now let's take a look at this. And as I said, we're going to look into some cross-references from the other Gospels. 
Now, let's move on. First of all, the location. Where did all this take place? Well, verse 1a makes it very clear. As they approached Jerusalem, they came to Beth Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Now, let's stop right there and let's talk about this. Jesus, for most part of his ministry, was in the north part, northern part of Israel. He was ministering along the Sea of the Galilee area. In exception, there are certain times that he had to come down to, to Jerusalem to, to attend certain functions and so forth. But most of his ministry in the three and a half years that he was on earth was taking place up in the north. Now, during his time, he would often perform miracles, do fantastic teachings. He had a huge crowd follow him. And often, when he does something miraculous, he would try to downplay what he did. And he often reminded the disciples and his followers, do not tell anybody of this because my time has not come. But when Jesus finally approached this time of the year, he finally decide to go into Jerusalem because he had a mission to fulfill. His time had come. So the scripture tells us a very important geographical clue. Bethphage on Mount of Olives. Now, when we look at this map, we kind of get an exact location as to where these things are. You have a road leading down to the city of Jerusalem. You have to go by this small town called Bethany. And further along, you have a town called Bethphage. And that's kind of like the last stop before you go down to the city, all right? Now, just to give you an idea of what the geography looks like in this place, you know, for the people who've never been to Israel, you know, you, I want to just show these series of slides to you. First of all, this is a 1700s, I think it's 1760 uh, watercolor of view of the walled city of Jerusalem. Notice the terrains. Jerusalem is situated on a hill, very high. It's about almost 700 meters above sea level. I remember going there one time, and when the bus goes up to Jerusalem, your ears literally pop, okay? It's like, like that high. And next to it, in which this picture is seen, is from the perspective of <coughs> Mount of Olives. Now, this is another photograph that's taken at the turn of the uh, 19th century, um, you see the people who are going to Jerusalem, they're on the valley below. This is the Kidron Valley looking up. So it's very rugged, very dry, very inhospitable, okay, very arduous to kind of move along in this terrain. This is a picture of the ancient city of Jerusalem right now, looking from the Mount of Olives. Okay? So when we look down to the city, you can see more or less, it's not very far, but yet far enough, and it would take a while to go down this road. Now, looking from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives, where this took place, is like this. Mount of Olives is about a thousand feet above, a uh, thousand meters above sea level. Okay, so there's quite a climb if you want to do that. And this is where Jesus was. Now, Bethphage, in which the text is talking about, is literally behind the mountain here. Okay, now we have that situated. What did they do in Bethphage? Well, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there and with her colt by her. Now, this is very important here. In the other Gospels, you only see one donkey. In this particular one, they made it a point to identify that there's a mother donkey and a younger donkey by her side. And then Jesus told his two disciples, specifically mentioned the two, to go and fetch these animals from an unspecified farmer who owns these and to go there and just take it. Now, it's quite interesting, like when you look at the other passages of Scripture, they all mention that it's only one. Now, why is this Matthew text so significant? Well, basically, we're going to see that in a little bit. Now, Jesus told these people to untie them and bring them to me. And anybody says anything to you, just tell them that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. So somehow in the foreknowledge of Christ, he knew what he was doing. He knew what's going to happen. He can see the donkeys right there. He told the disciples these things and basically expect them to carry these things out. Now, if you were the disciple, would you do that? Now, I can understand if I was a disciple, I'm kind of like a cautious and careful guy, okay? And usually, like, somebody tell me to do something, I was like, 
Jesus? Are you sure? You know, will the guy get mad? What do you mean just go and untie and bring it? It's like, don't you have to ask the guy? You know, are you telling me to steal? <laughs> That's even worse, right? So basically, you know, these disciples were like, okay. So Jesus said, you know what? Just tell them. If they ask you, tell them that the Lord needed it and they'll understand. You know what the uh, disciples do? They followed it. <laughs> That's the unique thing. That's amazing, right? So there's a lot there that we can take away from later on, which we'll look into. Now, the purpose of Jesus or intention of Jesus in doing this is that this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Now, which prophet is he talking about? Well, when we look at the text, we're going to see that this is a reference to an utterance that was made more than 600 years ago, okay, by Isaiah. And furthermore, you know, you have another direct fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. Now, what was this prophecy about? Well, it's cited here. Say to, the, uh, say to daughter Zion, meaning Israel, see, your king comes, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, in this prophecy that is highlighted here, there are two very significant points. The first one has to do with the coming of the king to Israel. This is a very, very explicit reference to the Messiah coming to his own people, which the Jews were anticipating. The second reference has to do with riding on a donkey. But it's not just one particular donkey, any kind of generic donkey. It's a very special donkey. What makes it so unique and so vivid, as described in this passage of Scripture, is that this is not just a donkey and a colt and the foal of a donkey. Now, we're going to explain why in a little bit. Now, this is the reference to Isaiah's prophecy that was fulfilled. In this passage, it says, Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the ends of the earth, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your Savior comes. Look, his reward is with him, and so forth. Okay, so basically the emphasis here has to do with the prophecy of the king coming to his own people. In Zechariah's prophecy, in Zechariah 9.9, this is even more explicit, and it highlights the second point. It highlights the idea that the king will be coming to the daughters of Zion, meaning the children of Israel, and that the he will be riding, he will be humble, and he will be righteous. He will be humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on a foal of a donkey. Now, what's the big deal about, you know, the donkey, right? Now, incidentally, when, when you ask people who knows about these things, about animals like donkeys and horses and all that, they will tell you that a colt is a very special term that they use for a young donkey. Okay, and a foal of a donkey means a donkey about a year old. So this is not a mature or fully grown adult donkey, but it's a smaller donkey, a younger one. And the thing about the foal is that usually people do not ride on a foal of a donkey because he will literally throw you off, right? Now, why is this prophecy so significant? Because everybody knew this that when you have the Messiah that comes to you, he'll be riding on a small donkey. It's very clear and, and very emphatic here. And this donkey will accept the rider on him. Now, further on, I, I say, okay, this is kind of weird. You know, for, for Jesus, a grown man, 33 years old at that time, riding on a little pony, that is not cool, <laughs> okay? That, that, that's not like how you envision a king coming. But Zechariah makes it very clear. And when I read further about some people who did research on this, they said that young donkeys do not like to be ridden upon. However, when the mother of that donkey is walking next to them, the donkey will be calm. That's why there's two donkeys. But when you read the other Gospels, aside from Matthew's account, they don't talk about two donkeys. They only talk about one. It gives you the impression that it's that Jesus wrote on a cult. 
but the specificity of, of Matthew's account makes it so that it fulfills this prophecy. And again, no wonder Matthew is a gospel that want to emphasize the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he took the pain to go into research and write down these things in such a way where we can understand. That's why when we read the story of Jesus, we need to triangulate, as they call it. We need to read further and wider to get a fuller picture. Ah, oh, my time is running out. Okay, now let's move on. This prophecy was eventually fulfilled, and Jesus, uh, basically the disciples did what they instructed them. You know, in other words, they were obedient. They brought the donkey to him, placed the cloak on him, and, uh, sit, uh, and, and Jesus sat on it, right? So next thing you know, they're on. They're going to the procession right there, okay? Now, then the next phrase says, a very large crowd, right? Fine, right? We all know that. A lot of people showed up for this, you know, waving the palms and, and throwing their cloak on the thing. Now, when we read Scripture, I think we need to be a little bit critical-minded, right? Where did these people come from, by the way? Why was there a large crowd and where did they come from were two questions that I ask. So we need to understand and get to the bottom of this. Does the Bible address this issue? Well, first of all, when we look at John's account of it, it tells you the answer. And we're not going to find the answer in, in Matthew's account. We'll look at John, and then he'll tell us. In the first verse of verse chapter 12, it says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus has raised from the dead. Now, that opens a whole new can of worms. First of all, we know that this is the Passover season. The Passover season is like the most sacred time for the Jews. And the Jewish people, as customary, they would all converge into Jerusalem where the temple was to perform sacrifices. So you can imagine that all the people from all over Israel, many parts of the world who are um, converted to, to the God, the worship God of Israel, they all came to this place. That's why there's a lot of people in town. It's kind of like Baguio in Christmas time. Everybody's there, right? It's kind of like that. So when you go to Jerusalem, you know, you're not going to find a hotel. So people will be like camping out in the nearby areas. You know, they can get a better deal on a hotel, right? You imagine if you go to Center City where the temple is, it's kind of like, oh, it's going to be very expensive and there's no room. So the places in and around the vicinity of Jerusalem, like Bethany and Bethphage, is full of people coming in. So there's a lot of people there. Another point that is mentioned here is that this is the place where Lazarus was, and they know that Jesus went to this place. Because Lazarus is from the town of Bethany, which is very close to Bethphage, it says, meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Now, you can imagine the scenario here, right? If you happen to be in Jerusalem at that time, and you hear all these fantastic stories about that Jesus who performed miracles by the Sea of Galilee is in town. And not only did he just do an um, amazing uh, miracle, he rose somebody from the dead. I mean, you don't hear that every day. You want to go check this guy out. You want to go see that dead person. Like, interview him. How is it like to be dead? <laughs> you know, like if you see a dead person come back to life, I'm sure you'll be fascinated too, right? And everybody want to get a piece of that. So Jesus went to this place and wanted to see all these things, right? And all these people came. Jesus is minding his business because he was a celebrity. Jesus all came to the house of Lazarus in which Jesus is staying with the two sisters. So you can imagine all the paparazzis around, camping around the outside, taking a peek at him. It's a good see, asshole. <laughs> okay, like, anyway, they're checking him out, right? And then also, when we look further on, notice in, in, in first, uh, John chapter 12, in verse 12 to 13, what does it say? The next day, the crowd, the great crowd that had come for the festival, had heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him. Ah, so we see the connection to this story. 
the connection to, to the, the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead has a lot of impact into this as to why the, so many people came to town. Okay, so we're able to see that aspect. Now, while we're in the Gospel of John, and the emphasis here in verse 13a, they took palm branches and went out to meet him. You know, this is the only one place in the Gospels that talk about palm branches. When you read the other three Gospels, you're not going to read the word palm mentioned. Right? And I was amazed because hey, last time I was trying to say, you know, the connection between Palm Sunday and the Scripture. When I read Matthew, it doesn't say palm tree. When you look, look at Luke's account or Mark's account, nobody mentions that it's a palm tree. They just mention it's a branch or something like that. But this one is very technical. Now, let's stay with the idea of the palm. All right, we have some palm branches. Some people were waving palm. I mean, that's fine. That's great, okay? But you know, I'm one of these purists, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a botany freak, okay? I'm, I'm really technical when it comes to plants. So I'd like to know what kind of palm they had, because there's thousands of species of palm, <laughs> okay? I'm, I'm like one of these nerds who get into botany, right? Well, when you look at the ancient Israel, and even Israel today, this is a very desert, arid country. And the palm trees that they have is what they call the date palm. This is an ancient tree that is associated with the festivals of Israel, and they would use this for celebration. So that's why if we want to get technical, this palm and our palm looks different. But the idea is the same, okay? So it's okay to wave our palms, all right? Now, the large crowd's reaction. Now, what did the crowd do? when they saw Jesus. Going back to Matthew's gospel, they spread their cloaks on the road, and while others cut branches from the tree and spread them on the road. Now again, I highlighted this fact that it just says they cut branches from the tree. They didn't mention that it was palm leaves, right? For all we know, it can be anything. Now, that's why I, I like this painting by this Italian artist from the early, early medieval times where you have the picture, a depiction of Christ entering to the city of Jerusalem on his triumphal entry. And notice in the background, in the upper left-hand corner, you see a guy going up on a tree to chop some branches. So this is a very literal account. But keep in mind, I don't know what kind of palm tree they have in, in Italy, but certainly it doesn't look like the one in Israel. But it's okay, point well taken, all right? It's fine, okay? Now, let's go into the significance of this very quickly. They did two things. They spread the cloak and then they waved the palm. What is the precedence for this and what does it mean? Well, the spreading of the cloak signifies to welcome royalty. Right? Because you have an account in the, in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 9, verse 13, that they quickly took their cloak and spread them under the bare steps. Then they blew their trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. Now, let me just kind of explain what this is about. There was a guy in the northern kingdom of Israel who was um, anointed as king. He was a good king, and it was a refreshing kind of thing for children of Israel in that northern kingdom because they had a, a long period of evil kings in their time. That was the time of King Ahab and Jezebel. And this is a guy who got anointed, and the children of Israel was celebrating the ushering of a new kingdom. So when the king was um, uh, anointed, the children of Israel took their cloaks, the most prized possession that they have, to put on the road for the king to walk on. So this is a precedence for the Jews. If they want to celebrate the coming of a king, this is what they do. Right? So this is why, this why when they did this with Jesus, it was very significant. It's a very clear sign that they're seeking to welcome a king into their midst. Now, what about the waving of the palm branches? Well, this kind of calls back uh, to a, 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 a psalm in 118, Psalm 118, verse 27b, where it gives reference to this idea of with boughs in their hand. 
You know, in the ancient times, the children of Israel used to have seven feasts. And in one of the feasts that they have, recorded in Leviticus chapter 23, has to do with uh, the Feast of the Tabernacle. And part of the Harvest Festival, they would use palm leaves as part of their celebration for this event. So this idea of using palm leaves is to signify royalty because of the stature of the palm tree, along with other symbolisms in the other plants. They would come and they would celebrate this by waving these things. Now we see another account of this just about 160 years before Jesus came into the scene. This is a passage from an apocryphal book. This is not from the Holy Bible that we call our Bible. But in the Catholic version, I think they might have this, in the book of 1 Maccabees. Now, before I read this passage of Scripture and its references to the palm leaf, I'd like to highlight that Maccabees is basically about a priest who's under the kingdom of the Seleucids, and basically they're under a lot of oppression. And this priest had the calling of God to, to form an army and overthrow this military conquest of their town. And as a result of their fight and wars with these empires, they're able to overthrow the rule and declare Jewish independence at that time, which was unfortunately short-lived. Because we know later on, the Romans came in, and during Jesus' time, the children of Israel were under Rome. So, what happened to Maccabees? Well, when they first overthrew the evil empire, the Seleucid kings, it says on the 23rd day of the second month, the Jews entered into the citadel with shouts of praise, waving what? Palm branches, because the great enemy of Israel has been crushed. Now, this is fresh in the mind of many Jews because this is recent history, only happened 160 years ago. And this is how they celebrate the conquest of foreign kingdoms, oppressing kingdoms, and you usher in a new era of hope. You know, the thing is, when people saw this, Jesus coming, they had high expectations for him. So the crowds went up to him and basically welcomed him. With those who shouted, followed him, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and Hosanna in the highest heavens. These are the things that they yell. Now let's break it down a little bit more. What does these statements mean? Well, we sang Hosanna earlier. Hosanna basically means save or to save us now. Later on in Hebrew, they, they use this as a praise to God and usually references the coming of the Messiah who will come to deliver the children of Israel. To the son of David, well, basically this phrase is, is, a, is a direct reference to the coming Messiah because we know that the Messiah will be a descendant of King David. And this will be more than just a prophet, a priest, and king, and he will be the Savior himself. So basically, all the Jews were looking for the Messiah, but we need to keep in mind, people are the product of their times. So during that time, what was their outlook on the Messiah? What was the Messiah like in their day? Well, we're going to answer that shortly. He says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, this is a quotation from Psalm 118. This is one of the halal psalms that they usually associate, the Jews associate with, with the celebration of the, um, the holidays and especially direct reference to the Messiah. And Hosanna in the highest heaven, which connotes salvation will come from God's anointed Messiah. Now, let me just talk about the people of their time. Technically speaking, the word Messiah means many things, okay? First of all, we can translate the word from Greek, from that Hebrew, to, to mean Christ, okay? That, that is a one definition of Messiah. Another one has to do with just the fact that that person is anointed. Now, someone who's anointed like King David was an anointed of God. King Cyrus was an anointed person of God too, okay? Or basically, it can mean something simple as God's chosen person. In the ancient times, 
to be an anointed servant of God or a Messiah in a small m can reference three individuals or three kinds of individuals, a prophet, a priest, and a king. We have examples of this in the Old Testament. Whenever the king is anointed, that act of anointing is basically connoting that this person is the Messiah. A very limited explanation. But what Jesus Christ is, is that he's all of these things and more. But the th thing is, the children of Israel at that time did not recognize that. The children of Israel had their cultural view of Jesus as a conquering hero in the order of Maccabees, who's going to overthrow the Roman Empire. And that was their definition of a Messiah. It has to do with a political leader who come to rescue their people. And remember, when these people are praising him, you know, they, they, this is what they had in mind. They were very upbeat. They were very joyful and praised God because they saw all the miracles that Jesus has done. And they're saying, hey, this has got to be our guy. Their definition of a Messiah is something that meets their immediate needs. When they saw the healer. They were just in Bethany. They talked to Lazarus. They say, yeah, how does it feel like to be dead? You know, and, and I, says, I don't know, Jesus rose me from the dead. Next thing you know, I'm walking out of the tomb. Everybody wanted Jesus because it meet their physical and immediate need. They want a king like that. They don't want some spiritual thing that you can't put your finger on. They want something immediate, concrete, that they can take with them. They want to go to Jesus and say, you know, I have this uncle. Or I have this auntie, my father is sick, can you come over? They want something immediate. This is blessed is this king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. You know, I think when the people were yelling these things, they didn't have a full understanding of what Jesus represents. On the other hand, the leaders of the Jews, the people who were instructing the people on their religious values and so on, and in many ways, these leaders, the Pharisees, were also politically very, very influential in Jewish society, said to Jesus, hey, I think you better stop these people from saying these things. Your disciples are getting out of hand. They're praising you. That's not a good thing. And I tell you, Jesus said, why not? They're doing a good thing. They're ignorant, but at least they still have this heart of worship. But the leaders who know better told them not to. So Jesus says, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Now, this is a very weird passage of Scripture. Over the next couple of minutes, I don't have a lot of time left. <laughs> Let's finish it, okay? Let's finish it. Now, the stones who cry out mean this is a very significant moment. I'm the fulfillment of the prophecy. I'm the God of heaven who have come to earth to save people from their sins. You've been looking for this Messiah for a long time, but yet you're telling the people not to worship me? Yeah, the people may be lost. They might have mixed motives, but you should know better. You're the leaders. What are you teaching these people? As Jesus approached Jerusalem in Luke's gospel, he saw the city and he wept over it. You know, this has got to be one of the saddest passages of Scripture. You know, during my time in Israel, I was there for like six weeks. The most moving experience I had was when I stood at the place where Jesus said these words. And then he says, if you only knew, even you had only know on this day, what would bring you peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. You know, in Israel, they have a church in that site. And this is designed by an Italian architect who designed it in a very, very small spot, a very small chapel, and it's shaped like a teardrop to signify Jesus weeping over the city. When you go into this dark church inside, you see a, mirror, a window there that overlooks the city of Jerusalem where the temple of the children of Israel were. 
And basically, this is one of the most moving things that I've been. And then you see the point in Jesus' is coming. They're celebrating him. But yet, the people did not know what they're celebrating. They're celebrating the Jesus of their own imagination. How they define Jesus according to them rather than Jesus and what he means in a real sense. In Matthew's account, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather you as children, like hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. At this point, Jesus rejected the children of Israel. Tragedy, the most tragic passage of Scripture. The people who are supposed to be about them, God's chosen people, miss the point because they do not know the Jesus that they have been following. So Jesus said, look, your house is left to desolate, to, to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who come in the name of the Lord. What does this passage mean? Well, the first part, Jesus pronounced a curse on Israel. The very house that these people were going to perform sacrifices and expecting the king to come to is no longer there. Seventy years after Jesus uttered these words, Rome came into this place. They ransacked the place, destroyed the place, burned the place, tortured and killed the people, took everything from the temple back. And since 70 AD, the children of Israel has been all over the world wandering as the wandering Jew. They missed the point. Jesus' second statement here, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, you're not going to see me until I come the second time. This time, I'm not going to come as a humble servant. I'm going to come as a conquering king. Then you will know what the significance is, and you had your chance. So we come to the last part. When Jesus entered in the temple, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? Isn't this anticlimactic? After all the jubilation, it turns out to, who's this guy? Wow. You know, many of us call us disciples of Jesus. But are we following the right Jesus? Is the Jesus that we're following the Jesus of the Bible who claims who he is? Or do we have another Jesus that defines who we are. For many people, Jesus is no more than a celebrity, famous guy. They want to be with the famous guy. Everybody wants to get a photo with the celebrity. Jesus was the biggest celebrity there was. For others, he was a healer, miracle worker. Hey, I need something from you. I want to go see Jesus. You know, I have an incurable disease. My father has an incurable disease. Hey, Jesus, can you come over sometime? Other people saw Jesus as a blasphemer and, and religious imposter. The religious communities didn't believe him. They said, this guy is not the real deal. He's an imposter. Other people says that he's just a preacher and a prophet. I mean, we have tons of these people who came and gone. He's just another guy. Others saw that he's the promised Messiah in their eyes. He would be in the form of a conquering king to overthrow the Romans so that we would enjoy political freedom. While others believed what he said. I like this painting because this painting kind of captured that. Then the final statement here in, in Matthew's gospel. Finally came to a consensus as the crowds answered, 
This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth in Galilee. Wow, profound. But you know, the last time Jesus in, was in Nazareth, when we went back to his hometown after he entered into the ministry and he became a celebrity, he went back to his own town. He started reading scripture in his hometown. And after reading the scripture, what did the community that he grew up with do? They kicked him out. They wanted to stone him to death. So this is when Jesus said in Luke 4, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. He got kicked out of his hometown. And these people, the best they can do is that Jesus is from Nazareth. He's a prophet. How ironic. The last time Jesus went there, the people tried to kill him. It goes to show the people did not know who he was. You know, this is a quote from a pastor. It says, Jesus is not a, just a prophet, but the fulfillment of prophecy. <sighs> he was in the world. The world was made by him and through him. The world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. John 1, 10 to 11. This is what it's about. You know, how does this relate to the Holy Week? I think that this is a very important event because without this event, there is no Holy Week. This is the last chance that God gave his people to accept him, but they did not. It underscores the fact that people are hopelessly blind and spiritually dead. But despite that, God did not hold that against us. He loved us despite that. It says, at first the disciples did not understand this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize these things have been written about him and that these things have been done to him. What about us? Do you understand the significance of Holy Week? I hope you do. I hope we don't have to grieve Christ like he wept over the city during that time. We call ourselves disciples. Are we obedient disciples? Finally, I know I'm over time. We thank you for your patience. Three takeaways. One, Jesus in his foreknowledge knew that he had to fulfill prophecies, but his disciples did not. Yet, the two disciples still obeyed and followed him. There are a lot of things in our lives that we don't understand. A lot of things that God is doing right now that we don't understand. But we, can we still trust him? We give that to you. You answer that in your own time, in your reflection. Secondly, people follow Jesus for various reasons. Some followed him to truly worship him. Some followed to harm him. Some followed because they seek to benefit from him. Some followed because simply there was a crowd of people following him. Which category do we fit? These are things that we need to reflect upon as we come to the Holy Week. And for, thirdly, the disappointing aftermath of Jesus' triumphal entry is a wonderful illustration of man's spiritual blindness and depravity in light of God's boundless mercy and selfless grace. God loves us in spite. It's not because we're good or deserving of his mercy. He loves us despite. It's all about the love of God that brought him down to earth to begin with. When we come to the Holy Week season, let us reflect. Not on this image. This is not biblical. Jesus rode on a smaller pony. <laughs> but the thing is, I hope that we will have a more critical view of things. And at the same time, appreciate the Word of God and appreciate the work of God 
in our lives. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today that we can look into your text and to learn from you. We learn about the, the heartaches and the pains that you encounter during this time. And we pray that as we look back and apply this in our lives, that we would know better than the people did at your first coming. Lord, you're going to come back again. And we pray that in that time, we can truly proclaim Hosanna, Hosanna, like the song that we sang earlier, that your heart would truly align with ours and that you would be the Lord of our lives. This is our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. Indeed, we have a high priest. That's why we have an access to his throne. And it is comforting to know that we are forgiven and loved despite our imperfection. As we sing this response song, may we be reminded of his mercy is more. listen to some announcements. Inviting everyone to join us in our online Monday Thursday service on March 28th from 7.45 p.m. via our YouTube channel. The next Sunday, March 31, 2024, is our Resurrection Sunday. Service will begin at 9 a.m. 
at the second floor main sanctuary with Reverend Stephen Kwan as our speaker. Tatlong tulog na lang, family camp na. Are you excited? So, assembly time on March 27 is 12.30 p.m. at the lower chapel. Buses will leave at 1 p.m. So, please have your lunch and come early. Please remember to bring your own tumblers and toiletries. Towels, hand soap, and bathroom tissue will be provided. For campers leaving their cars at the UECP open parking, please note that it's on a first-come, first-served basis. We'll collect your car details for registration on that day upon entry. UECP will not be held liable for any da damage to your vehicles. Then an email containing additional notes and reminders were sent to your inbox or emails last March 21. Kindly take a moment to review it. Just want to remind everyone that our Level Up classes will be held every Sunday, 9 to 10, 15 a.m., starting this April 7 until May 26, with starting strong classes at the Youth Hub and growing deeper classes at the First Timothy Room. Scan the QR code there, flash on the screen, or sign up on the link provided. Next Sunday, March 31, we'll witness the baptism of the following shown on the screen. It is wonderful to see parents bringing their children into the covenant family of God. Our mission fund target for the past year, 2023, is 17 million. As of March 22, we have received a total of 11,628,805.15 centavos in offering. So that is 68%. This means that we only have till the end of March to reach our target. Let's take an active part in the work of missions by praying, going, and giving. Let us continue to pray and support our church mission ministry. Inviting all children to celebrate Children's Sunday on April 14, 10 a.m. with venues at Daniel Room for grade, six to, uh, grade 3 to 6. 2 Timothy for Kinder 2 to Grade 2, and Samuel Room for Toddlers to Nursery. Fun activities await every little kid. Our church is now looking to hire for the job vacancy shown on the screen. If you are interested and know someone interested in applying, please email the resume to euecp1170 at gmail.com or you can also call us at the numbers 8251162126. Inviting also everyone who can understand and speak Amoy or Hokkien to join the Joy Fellowship. This will be held once a month starting this April 13, Saturday from 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. at the Recreation Room. Let's all rise as we ask Reverend Willie Cheng to give us the benediction. Let's pray. Father, we are indeed grateful and thankful for your great love and mercy that even while we were yet sinners, ungodly and wicked, our Lord died for us. We are indeed forever grateful for what you have done for us, Father, through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as we leave this house of worship and spend this vacation time for this week. Help us to reflect, to spend time with our Lord, to meditate upon what He has done for us, the great love and mercy toward us, and apply and obey, Lord, your commands that we might live a life that will be pleasing, acceptable to you. The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and Amen.
good week ahead.